Welcome back. This is the third of the mini professional experience sessions, mini PEs, brought to you by the STEM Equity Initiative. As with each video course, please take time to listen, learn, and experience the content provided. Reflect on it and discuss it with your colleagues. Take notes on important points you may want to revisit for further reflection or discussion. At the end of the video, a link to the STEM Equity Initiative's website will connect you to this and other videos and resources for learning more. You may recall that the NEAR model stands for Normalize, Empower, Inclusive, and Relevant. In Mini PE2, we introduced Normalizing. The goal of this third Mini PE is to deepen your knowledge of the second of the four indicators that are experienced by the students and teachers in an equitable learning environment, Empower. For this session, we will also continue to deepen our understanding of the NEAR model, to create new thinking and tools to address systemic barriers in education. The model includes the NEAR indicators we just mentioned, the NEAR process for improvement, and the NEAR educators and school stakeholders, who we refer to as implementers. Yes, the educators are part of the model, not just the people learning about it. In the NEAR model, we recognize that educators are more than just receivers of information. They're also the producers of the knowledge from the education field that represents the wisdom of the practice. The NEAR model was created through a synthesis of voices from thousands of teachers over decades of work and quality peer-reviewed research. In the NEAR model, the educators are the experts, the developers, and the assessors of what works in their very diverse CTE and STEM classrooms and must be part of the model as the implementers for the model to evolve and remain relevant. The third and final part of the model is the NEAR process for improvement. This cycle is similar at the top level to many other improvement cycles with one important difference. We begin with an evaluation of the current state of the school, educators, and students not just an assessment of student needs. It may not be noticeable at first, but this is a significant transition from traditional models and is critical for systemic change. When we introduced the NEAR model in Mini PE1, we started by asking for a detailed assessment of student, school, and community assets. What are the strengths and areas in need of attention? What data do you have and what do you need to find out? What assets do you have in your school, and what deficits remain? By understanding the assets of your education system, you're identifying resources and capabilities that can be incorporated into an improvement plan. The NEAR process for improvement also provides a more operational approach that makes it easier to adapt to your specific situation. It's applicable to large strategic initiatives or to day-to-day -day improvements in an individual classroom. The cycle steps include assess current state, analyze requirements, propose and design possible solutions, develop possible solutions, deliver the product or service, and collect feedback. Actually, you're always collecting data, but now you bring it all together to support the next step, evaluating the new current state. To help me demonstrate the cycle, Shonda is going to provide a well-understood challenge for many educators, lack of student engagement. Chris is going to connect the challenge to the NEAR process. Hi, Chris. I have three students who are really struggling right now. When they were in school, I could keep them on task. But now with virtual education, it's even harder. They don't show up or they seem distracted while they're on their computers. Once back in class, they put their heads down on their desks and they don't complete their tasks. They come unprepared to class or show up without their homework done. Their work is sloppy. I don't know what the problem is. Are they just goofing off or is the content too challenging? I send them messages and emails but get no response. Should I start calling parents? Our goal is not to jump to a solution. Collecting information, also called data, is key. 
Let's walk through the process that begins by assessing the current state. First, you need to inventory your assets and identify areas needing attention, avoid focusing only on problems, and also take note of the student's many assets, as these will be key to improvement efforts. Okay, I have 15 students in my engineering class. Of the three students who seem unengaged, Jackson has a mother who owns a small cleaning business. Eliza has a parent who works at a major company that employs my engineering students when they graduate, but I hear they've been laying off. Beckett is very quiet, and I know nothing about him, although I heard from another teacher his sister has been crying in class. I have access to a great counselor. My colleagues are all great teachers and may have some ideas. I have two high-performing students who work independently, get every assignment completed on time, and score nearly perfect on every task. I have all new equipment purchased just three years ago. Oh, and I have a paraprofessional, and she is great at seeing what needs to be done and just doing it to keep the class moving. Okay, what about the three students who are not performing well? What are their assets? Hmm, I'm not sure. I guess I could find out through an activity or assignment if they would do it. I could ask previous teachers, look at previous grades or disciplinary records. Look for the assets or strengths as well as the previous challenges. What school did they attend? How well are they doing at their sending school? Are they a member of a special population? If so, how might that be viewed as both a strength and an area of opportunity for learning? So I need to gather data. Jackson, one of my students, generally did well in the small group discussions, but I noticed he stopped talking to his classmate, Mary. When he is with his friend, Craig, Jackson can be very competitive and put in more effort. Elisa comes in every morning looking tired and unwashed lately. Beckett is the class clown. He finishes all the assignments ahead of time, but in a haphazard way, and then just looks bored and gives up trying. Jackson is super capable when he puts the effort in. Elisa may need some help outside of school, but could also use some help in class. Maybe Jackson could help her, and she could help him, as she is very nice and empathetic. Beckett is a natural leader, so I may need to work with the school to find him some additional outlets for his attention-seeking skills. Hmm, I may need to think about each student separately. The symptoms are the same, poor performance, but the cause may be different. The qualities you just identified to me while thinking about Jackson, Elisa, and Beckett include competitive, capable, empathetic, and natural leader. These are all assets that can be developed to empower your students. Letting these students know that you recognize these qualities is essential to helping them understand their value in work and life. After all, people usually get hired for academic credentials but are fired for lack of interpersonal or social skills or career traits such as problem solving or creativity. We need to develop these talents in our students as well. We begin by helping them recognize their natural gifts and talents that go way beyond what we can measure with a standardized test. You are right. I seldom say anything to my students about those qualities, and yet those are the qualities that make them each strong students and people I care about. Exactly. Pause and reflect. Have you ever looked at a student's name on your attendance sheet and assumed certain characteristics for them based on your previous experiences with their siblings? When a student does not perform at a level you think they should reach, do you express disappointment through anger, criticism, or sadness? How do you learn about your students without appearing to pry? What resources do you have in place if a student shares with you their concern about homelessness, divorce, drug use, racism, sexism, or another ism, an emotional breakup or loss, abuse in the family, or illegal activities? What if a student openly says they are bored with the curriculum, don't care about learning, or demonstrates a lack of interest in education broadly? 
Take the time needed or consider a place where educators can safely discuss these concerns and how to address them without judgment or emotional defensiveness. Today, we're focusing on empowering as a means to answer questions of fairness and equity. We recognize that students with the greatest needs still possess unique gifts and talents that are developing or being revealed as they try new things. Throughout life, we continue to find these qualities that surprise us and bring joy in understanding who we are. As educators, we need to both help develop students' academic, social, and personal gifts and talents as a means to develop their character, and see them as individuals born with natural capabilities needed to support themselves and serve others. How they will ultimately turn out is their story that only they can tell. Helping them find it may mean a course correction out of your program or career area, or it may mean a deepening of their interest in your course that you never saw coming. Empower refers to a mindset that all students are assets in their classroom and are individually responsible for and recognized for their own learning and the learning of others. Brazilian educator Paulo Freire studied the concept of empowerment in school environments and educational settings 50 years ago. He found that an educational system can either liberate marginalized students or maintain systems of oppression that fail to give students a voice and opportunity to control their educational destiny. Intrapersonal student empowerment is predicted by equitable power use of teachers, positive teacher-student relationships, and a sense of community in the classroom. Empowering students entails building their self-efficacy and resilience. For you STEM equity initiative nerds, I want to point out two well-recognized theories that support the empowering construct. The first is social cognitive career theory, which is very relevant to career and technical education. Social cognitive career theory looks at the effect of time on career interest development and the importance of self-efficacy and outcome expectations. In other words, you have to believe you can be successful in a field or career pathway before you will even consider it. This builds on the normalizing ideas we talked about in the last mini-PE. Social cognitive career theory also suggests that interventions that are designed to increase self-efficacy should have a positive impact on career interests and decisions. Students' beliefs about themselves and their competency can influence their courses, programs, and career choices. Understanding internal and external forces that influence both course choices and career options allows teachers and counselors to establish optional trajectories with their students. The second theory supporting the empower construct is called structural empowerment theory. This theory looks at the person's belief about their access to power in the work or school setting. Carol Dweck deepened our understanding of social empowerment theory when she introduced and defined the concept of mindset in 2006. Mindset is a core belief among students that they are either empowered or disempowered to learn and added it as an essential element for student resilience in education. Resilience serves as a key factor in building self-efficacy among children, youth, and families. Resilience research has shown that individuals growing up in challenging contexts or facing significant personal adversity are more or less affected based on the social and physical environments that surround the individuals more than their personality. Building resilience is a process that educators in schools can facilitate. Learned helplessness, also defined in the research, is real and a condition difficult to undo once established. But it can be undone over time with a shift in mindset. The difference between resilient students and vulnerable ones is the opportunity for growth and the influence of environments that facilitate or inhibit resilience-promoting processes. Empowering students by supporting a positive mindset related to their assets builds resilience when they face academic, social, and personal challenges. To demonstrate the Empower indicator, let me introduce Kate Washington, a student in the plumbing program at Commonwealth Career and Tech Center. Listen carefully to her story. 
Pause and reflect. In what ways did Kate Washington's story demonstrate each of the four near indicators? How did Kate's many influencers, other students and stakeholders inside and outside the school, help to build her self-efficacy? What final input helped Kate make her decision? Think about how the broader relevancy of the occupation connected to her interests and empowered her to think about ways to impact the world. What programs do you have in place to empower current students to help with the mission of your school or career areas? Up until now, we've asked you, our patient educator, to pause and reflect. Now it's time to begin implementing some of what you've learned. Look again at your improvement process cycle, but this time, put the face of a student or group of students in the middle of the cycle to ensure that they are always your focus. Step one, collect data on the assets and challenges of your students to understand if the challenges are temporary or chronic. Gathering information before you seek a solution is critically important. Too often, educators do what is called pre-solutioning. This means we try to solve the problem before we even know fully what the problem is. The result is our failure to achieve our goal for the student and a belief that we lack the ability to create positive change. Step two, design a process to help students identify their assets, which might help them address their challenges as well. This process should instill a belief in the student's current emerging gifts and talents that they can tangibly experience and appreciate. Your recognition of the student's personal and academic assets are the key to empowering them to engage and achieve academic, social, and personal success. Steps three and four. Identify, develop, and deliver resources to support your design. One great resource for helping students identify their assets are empowerment cards. These cards are free from the STEM Equity Initiative to modify for your school and download for your desk to hand out whenever you see a great example of an emerging asset. Create your own cards or establish an asset bulletin board. The important point is that students witness and experience, visually or verbally, the power of their own assets. Another resource for empowering students is guest speakers representing traditionally underrepresented students or who overcame a personal academic challenge when they were in your class. Ask them to talk about their career and their personal journey of growth to bring them to where they are today, both professionally and personally. Another strategy is measuring the number of in-class questions you get. Asking questions demonstrates a student's comfort with risk-taking in the classroom and a feeling of confidence in themselves and the subject matter. The number one indicator of an empowered student is their asking questions. Using a scale over time to count hand-raising is a great way of measuring change in behaviors resulting from your efforts. Step five, measure the outcome. Did the empowerment cards create a more engaged student? If your goal was to increase interest in your program, did you see more hands raised with questions during a tour? If you had students visit your program for an hour or more, how many questions did they ask? The final step of the improvement process is to, again, assess the current state. Given what we learned from the implementation of the first cycle, do we need to revisit the challenge or move to a new one? Did we collect the data we needed to decide this? This process should not be onerous or time-consuming, but rather help us as educators improve our practice over time to benefit all of our students. Empowering students does not begin with a hurricane-sized event, but with a small series of statements, subtle messages, and repeated acknowledgments. Empowering students comes with your eye contact and smile, the task of students teaching others, a positive word, a head nod, or a thumbs up when they accomplish a goal. Congratulations, you did it again. You completed the third mini PE. You've added to your toolbox an initial understanding of the application of the NEAR process for improvement to better engage students or improve classroom or school practice. You're looking for ways to empower your students. As you empower them, you'll find yourself empowered as well. Great teachers create great students who create great teachers. 
We see you, and we thank you. Keep going. You rock.